land management technician is what they call them. And I coordinated a lot of our non-native invasive species removal projects on our state owned natural areas. And uh, currently I'm the, what they call the ha a habitat coordinator for the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. So really I do the same thing, same, same type of work, but I'm managing, helping to manage larger projects where we have either contractors come in with, with heavy equipment and do the type of work uh, regarding uh, non-native species removal, um, using heavy equipment that we don't have, or uh, larger hand crews, so large groups of 25 to, to sometimes 45 individuals that come in and uh, remove non-native species by hand uh, using uh, big machetes and, and chainsaws and stuff like that. And then I also do some other things, just what uh, one thing that we do a lot of is timber stand improvement. You might hear someone say TSI also, and that's where um, we have a lot of pine stands or we've purchased um, property that's neighboring some of our natural areas that have been in, historically in industrial pine plantation. Um, so they've gone in and planted pine trees by rows, but some of that can actually be restored back to um, a natural state. So in some places, especially where it hasn't been uh, degraded or um, so, so badly, as in going in with the bulldozer and bulldozing the, the land and then planting pine trees or hardwoods, but some places they just went in and planted pine trees by hand. Well, we can go, we can follow that up and remove several of those pine trees and eventually have the native seed back, bank grow back. And it will, um, you can actually restore some of those areas to, to protect um, not only the native biodiversity that's still there on those uh, on those properties, but especially some of the neighboring properties that what what you'd call uh, remnant uh, natural areas that have never been disturbed, never seen heavy um, habitat destruction. And so having those, uh, doing that timber stand management on those neighboring properties helps to protect uh, the some of the immediately adjacent properties that have never seen large disturbance. Uh, anyway, so um, let me real fast talk about the iNaturalist app. It's, uh, it's both on, you can go to iNaturalist.org if you can see that on your screen. Here it is right there. That's their website. And it's also a mobile app. Um, so you can buy it or not buy it. It's all free. This is all free. Um, and I don't work for them, nor do I have a financial investment in their stock. So this is not, uh, hopefully that shows that I'm not being biased, but it's a, it's a really neat app that um, I've be, I'm becoming more familiar with, but you can uh, use it to, basically it's a citizen science web-based app that also has a little hint of social media in it. And you can uh, create an account with iNaturalist, and then you're able to take photographs of things in, in their natural state and um, post those onto the, uh, the app, and they call those post observations. And they have a software that will help you identify uh, the biological entity that you're observing. And also um, they, there are professional naturalists, professional biologists that can follow behind you and look at the photos that you take and help you to identify those. And um, so on the, on kind of a superficial level, it's kind of a neat way to take pictures of um, observe, make observations on if you're going on a hike outside or just in your backyard. 
And uh, so that's kind of, you know, just for fun type things. But also there are things what they call projects. And uh, for an example is there's a project for the native biodiversity for the state of Arkansas. And so that would be um, you take a picture or make an observation and you can connect it to that. You join a project and you can join the biodiversity of Arkansas project and that will um, that will attach that observation to that project. And then there's someone behind that project, like an administrator, who is keeping an inventory of all the, the, all the biota for the state of Arkansas. And um, so there are actually other projects uh, similar to the Native Biodiversity Project for the state of Arkansas. There's one uh, strictly for non-native invasive species for Arkansas. So it's, it's a professor is the administrator and the project leader who's based out of uh, the University of Arkansas in Monticello. And he created a project for non-native invasive species in the state. And so you can, if you take a picture of a non-native invasive species in the state and make an observation or observe something that you think might be a non-native invasive species, then you can connect it to that project and he can come behind you and look at your photograph and make sure and help you identify it. And then for him on his end, he will eventually have a map of the non-native invasive species for Arkansas. And as we'll hopefully we'll get in that today, um, mapping and knowing where non-native invasive species are in the state is very helpful when we are our planning, uh, our, our strategy or our strategies for um, helping to remove those non-native species or at least to manage for those, uh, for those non-native invasive species. Um, real quick, if I can do it, I'd like to, and I, I, can, I see a few photos in the in the zoom account but uh it looks like we have 22 participants is that about right yeah that's what I, we're 23 now so yes if you uh, so i see a lot of you a lot of you may have your screens muted or you may may be like me and uh being a poor zoom user and for some reason can't get my screen to show but the ones i can see how many of you are familiar with non-native invasive species and kind of have a general idea of what non-native invasive species are. So I see a couple hands, several hands being raised. I do see uh, maybe one that does not have her hand raised. I see some new faces. There we go. Now we're joining up. So it looks Someone like we have several people know what non-native species are i got a thumbs up from matthew thank you very much yeah you can use up. your reactions for clapping or thumbs up yeah. or whatever that shows maybe we could do like a wave where we wave down the blocks <laughs> thumbs up. that would be yeah that would i think that would take hours of coordination but i do see several faces that look like they are in, uh, familiar with non-native invasive species or to some extent, and then um, some people that may not be as familiar. Um, so let me see if I can uh, get the PowerPoint up and going now. Um, also, It looks like my video is still not running for some reason, but let's see if I can get the, um, PowerPoint up. Can you see that? Almost. Yay. E.T., phone home, yes. All right. Yeah, yeah. So 
I don't, I don't know. I guess maybe there's a solar flare that's not agreeing with my uh, internet connection. But it's, it seems like it's going slow. But we're here now. And so um, did you see that slide change objectives? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, learn a little bit about the presenter. I, I've talked a little bit about that. Define some invasive or define invasive species why it's important to address the problem, uh, name three means of reducing populations of, of unwanted plants on natural areas. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we accomplish that work. And uh, also an important part of today will be knowing where to go for more information about non-native invasive species. Um, I Real quick, I did send an email uh, to I think Nancy, I don't know if I send it to Ann also, but with some, uh, some of the resources that I'll uh, refer to today, and I think hopefully we can get that to you guys probably via email. One is a, there's a Word document that has, and I think the title of it is Non-Native Invasive Species uh, Information Resources. And that has a list of uh, internet-based um, websites and documents that will uh, that I'll refer to today and provide a lot of information about non-native species and then I think there was also a pamphlet in there that was uh, non-native non invasive species as a biological wildfire and that's a pretty neat document um, that kind of makes an it makes an analogy between non-native invasive species and a wildfire you know we all have know what a catastrophic wildfire kind of looks like and can do to to an environment you know it can it can destroy your house it can destroy a park it can be very devastating especially fires like out in, in california um and that's a, that's a good way to think about your not our non-native invasive species. They these are species that have been introduced to our uh, into our environment from another another environment where they have kind of grown and evolved outside of our environment, so that when they arrive here, they don't have the natural stressors that would keep their populations under control. So they're, they arrive here in North America one way or another, and they are now growing in our environment without their natural predators, without their natural um, uh, well, uh, not viruses, but without their natural uh, diseases and uh, they're able to grow to in an exponential way it's, and they're able to outcompete our native biodiversity. Um, so a lot, you know, it's, it's, it's a slow moving wildfire. So plants um, and, and animals, they don't move as quickly as, as a catastrophic wildfire in many ways, but slowly they are able to um, destroy our environment in, in, in the ways that a catastrophic wildfire can. Um, so that, that's kind of a big concept, a big uh, thing to swallow. <laughs> so let's, I'll back up a little bit and kind of introduce more of who I worked for and um, some things like that. Can you see that I moved to the, to the yeah. presentation mode? Okay, so I work for the Department of Arkansas Heritage. Uh, we've recently actually become the become part of the Arkansas Department of Parks, Heritage, and Tourism. So we used to be a standalone department, and we were we're a pretty small department compared, especially to Parks and Tourism. But now we're all under the same umbrella department, and we are what you call like uh, the Parks, Heritage, and Tourism. Those three things are those three entities are divisions and so we're a division of the department of parks heritage and tourism and inside the heritage part there are 
seven different agencies that are part of the Her uh, Department of Heritage. So there's the Arkansas State, or the, yeah, the Arkansas State Archives. They used to be the History Commission. Uh, there's also the Arkansas Arts Council. There is the, um, the Historic Preservation Program. Um, the, and a lot of us are the Historic Preservation Program and the Arts Council, we're all based at our new office at the intersection of Chester and La Harp on uh, 1100 North Street. That's our office there. It's a pretty neat building that we would be in today, I think, but because of the non-native invasive species coronavirus, that we don't have our any natural, um, uh, what would you call that? Natural antibodies for, uh, we've been, we're all locked in our own homes or offices where we're social distancing. But uh, it, when we get past all this, maybe one day you can come and visit us at our office at 1100 North Street. Uh, in that office, we have, it, for the Natural Heritage Commission, there are three sections. There's the outreach and education section, the research section, and also the stewardship section. So the outreach and education section, they manage our Facebook page and our, we have an Instagram page. And we also have a, a newsletter that goes out, I think, quarterly. Uh, you can find all that information at our website, which I believe is www.naturalheritage.gov. So I'd encourage you to visit that uh, website. I think that website is on the information sheet that you might get in an email. And there, there's a lot of really neat things on our website. Um, and I'll, uh, kind of point to some of these things as we go, just so we don't take up a lot of time with that. But uh, there's a lot of things with our outreach, uh, for our outreach and education section on the website. There's also a lot of things for our research section on the website and a lot of things for our stewardship section on the website. I'm, I'm part of the stewardship section as the Habitat coordinator. And what we do in the stewardship section is that we help to manage and protect the native Arkansas biodiversity. Um, my battery's running low, so let me go get my charger real fast. <laughs> oh boy. And now a word from our sponsor. <laughs> oh. Believe it or not, I did do some preparation, but I guess. <laughs> oh, it's technology. Like plants of mice and men. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We'll have okay. That's uh, uh, naturalheritage.com, by the way. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yep, you got to keep me on my toes. Uh, so the stewardship section for the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission, we uh, protect and manage for our native biodiversity on the 75 state-owned natural areas that are throughout the state. Um, this is our old emblem our old uh, Natural Heritage Commission emblem. That's a red cockaded woodpecker. But this is our new emblem. We, it, this is actually is uh, several years old now, but we used to have this emblem on, on our trucks. And then we used to, I think currently we have this emblem on our trucks. And I think of now we'll have this emblem on our trucks. So if you see this emblem, that's us. Um, but anyway, this is a picture of, uh, of the map of Arkansas with those different natural areas. So I would imagine most of you are, are more or less in, in the central part of the state. And you can go to our website and you can search by county for all the different natural areas. And those are, for the most part, all open to the public. Some of those, um, because of uh, access problems, uh, we have not developed uh, public access, but those are really um, a small number of the natural areas that don't have public access. I think there's one um, 
uh, up on Crowley's Ridge. Maybe it's uh, number it's number seventy one there in Cross County. That's Wittsburg Natural Area. Uh, there's not public access there, and there may be one other one that doesn't have public access. But uh, on the other side of that, there are some that are actually within city limits of of towns. There's one down in Jefferson County. Um, Number 51, that is uh, Bird Lake Natural Area, and that's right, it's not right in the middle, but it's uh, in the city limits of Pine Bluff. It's, it's an old uh, remnant where the Gulf Coastal Plain meets the Arkansas-Mississippi River Delta, and it's just an area that never was developed. It was owned by a farming family, and they eventually turned it over to the state. And now it's just like this real neat natural area right in the middle of Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Um, it's an old Oxbow Lake, Bird Lake, that is uh, part, or at one time was Bayou Bartholomew. Bayou Bartholomew starts kind of in Jefferson County, Grant County, and goes, it's the old river channel for the Arkansas River, and it goes all the way down into Louisiana. And uh, it, they say that is it's the longest bayou in the world. And I talked to one guy that works for the USGS, the United States Geological Survey, and we were talking about how it's the longest bayou in the world. And he said, you know, you can't find any academic proof of that. <laughs> uh, but you can't find any academic proof saying it's not. So <laughs> I think we're going to go with that. That was kind of a funny conversation I have, but that's a really neat area. It actually is a uh, Bayou Bartholomew itself is a state park down in Louisiana. Um, but there, you know, for each one of these natural areas, there's a story like that, that uh, kind of tells you some un, or what, before I worked for the Natural Heritage Commission, I, I didn't know much about that. And so I think I would encourage you to at least to visit our website and look at the different natural areas uh, you can find photographs of plants and animals on those natural areas just on the on the website alone, and uh, it's really pretty neat. Now, s some of you may already know have a lot of that information, but for those who don't, I would I would recommend it. Um, so today we'll be talking about non-native invasive species, and I'll focus really on plants. Um, a lot of my experience is with plants. Uh, I was a weed technician for the Nature Conservancy up in uh, North Dakota and Minnesota. And so that's kind of how I got my foot in the door uh, to where I am today. And uh, worked for the Nature Conservancy in Arkansas for several months and then um, got on with the Natural Heritage Commission to coordinate our non-native invasive plant projects. Um, but that being said, there are a lot of different non-native species that are not plants. There's a, uh, there can, that's my scary slide for non-native invasive species. It's like the, that's like the personification of the coronavirus right there. Uh, but, um, you know, we had, there are a lot of reasons why we would want to keep our eyes on non-native species that are entering the United States, uh, whether they be plants or bugs or diseases. And real quick, I'm gonna try to, um, this could go bad or go well, but I'm gonna try to do what Nancy said may not be a great idea and play a video <laughs> and we'll see how that goes. Uh, but let me know how this goes. It's coming up. And the incredible story of how the hippopotamus. Can you guys hear that? The video. Hear it, but we don't we see hear the it. video. You don't see it. We see a picture of a poster, but not a video. The, what does the poster have on it? American <laughs> hippopotamus. That's the PowerPoint. Um, what do you see now? Same thing. Oh, 
all you're sharing is your PowerPoint thing. So if the video is in another window, you'll have to switch windows. Now it's now you're up. Okay, let's try this. Uh, and if you could, if you don't see or hear the video, just uh, give me a big thumbs down and I'll go back to this PowerPoint. Okay. But okay. If, if this works, it, I can explain it also, but the video is a little bit better at it. Um, but this is a story about the American hippopotamus. It's based on a true story and it kind of will give you a, a general idea of non-native invasive species, how they get here, what they can do or how they get here despite our best laid plans. So let's let's see if this works. The incredible story of how the hippopotamus almost became a staple of the American diet. In the early 1900s, the United States began to experience a meat shortage, overgrazing, overpopulation, and a surging demand abroad were the main causes. At the same time, southern Louisiana was being overtaken by an invasive species water hyacinths, which were transported there as a gift from the Japanese delegation during the 1884 World's Fair. The hyacinths multiplied like rabbits, entirely covering swamps, bayous, rivers, and other water bodies, making navigation by boat almost impossible, destroying shipping routes, and greatly affecting local ecological systems. In less than 20 years, Louisiana was covered in water hyacinths. The army even tried pouring oil on them and setting swamps on fire. But the seeds can survive for almost 30 years. Louisiana Congressman Robert Broussard gathered two partners, adventurer and Boy Scout founder Frederick Burnham and Fritz Duquesne, a big game hunter who spied for Germany during both world wars. The partners created the New Food Supply Society with the goal of importing hippopotamuses to Louisiana. They argued the hippos would eat all the hyacinths that were covering the water and would provide a significant source of meat for the South. Amazingly, the plan had the full support of Teddy Roosevelt and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. In 1910, Broussard introduced H.R. 23621, also known as the American Hippo Bill. The plan would have cost $250,000 at the time, about $6 million today. It had the support of the New York Times, the Washington Post, and many other major papers. The New York Times even wrote how excited it was for Lake Cow Bacon. The bill failed by one vote. And while Burnham and Duquesne both tried to continue the project, the Mexican Revolution and World War I would eventually draw away their attention. And the plan was forgotten. Today, the state of Louisiana spends millions of dollars regularly spraying herbicides to destroy the water hyacinths. So it sounded like that worked. Yes. And at this yeah. point, I would, I would plug. I'm. I. I think we should get that idea moving again. And if you want to make a small <laughs> investment in our hippopotamus uh, introduction, uh, you can Venmo me that, and Nancy will give you my Venmo information. <laughs> but you can see there that story just really sums it up. You got several different or at least a couple uh different introductions or possible introductions of non-native invasive species onto the uh, north american landscape we had water hyacinth introduced from south america by the japanese and uh water hyacinth today is just it's a big problem it uh later on i can show you a photograph of it that I took at in Bird Lake Natural Area. Uh, it's it just can really overtake a waterway and as the video showed that has impacts both on our trade, our ability to uh, navigate up and down those water channels, but also on the aquatic life. Yeah. 
the water it uh, keeps ox it depletes water of oxygen and other nutrients, and so it affects our our fishing, and all just a a a cascade of negative results based on just the introduction of that one plant that came from outside of our ecosystem and and now that it's outside of its ecosystem is able to grow without its natural predators without its natural diseases and it's able to grow um unabated and to the extent that it has such a negative impact on our native biodiversity uh, one thing i will say for water hyacinth is that we're kind of it from my uh what would you call that anecdotal experience it seems like we're on the edge of where water hyacinth cannot grow because of our winter winter weather and so that's probably one element that historically and prehistorically has kept it uh, isolated down in it towards the equator but um you know we get we haven't recently but our winters can get so cold that it probably naturally reduces its populations not so much in louisiana new orleans but in arkansas at least um and then to deal with this problem you had uh some guys some some entrepreneurs uh some people that thought they were going to uh kill two birds with one stone that wanted to introduce hippopotamus to North America to take care of the water hyacinth, which seems kind of like a good idea, but then you start to think, and it, it's something that I've learned recently, you know, evidently hippopotamus are not the fr most friendly uh, <laughs> animals. I've heard that they actually can do pretty, uh, they're, they can be deadly to humans. And I've seen videos where they, you know, crush a watermelon with their, their jaws. And um, so I don't, I don't have a hippopotamus as a pet. And I don't know if we'd be wanting them to be roaming freely up and down the Mississippi River. Although I have to be, be honest and say, I wouldn't mind trying some hippopotamus bacon. That sounds really good. <laughs> but this, hey, this slide here. Uh, yes. Did you want to I'm sorry, you're about to say this slide. We're still on the last uh, ending yeah. of the video. Okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Um, but I thought that's, that was a pretty cool story. Yeah, feel free to uh, tell me. Screen sharing has stopped. Okay. I'll go back to the PowerPoint now. Uh, there are several examples very similar to that story although not as uh kind of attractive as the hippopotamus story or outlandish as the hippopotamus story uh, and there you know for every non-native species that we have kind of in in north america in the state of arkansas there is a similar uh kind of trajectory about the the arrival of those species uh can you see it now yes okay um so this real quick the american hippopotamus that that's how i initially got uh introduced to that crazy idea and it's a short that's a, actually a short story by this guy john mualem and so if you're if you're interested in doing a little side reading it's a pretty neat uh story not only about the idea of the introducing the american or hippopotamus into america but it also tells a story about <clears throat> it's really about uh spies during world war ii there's a whole nother side story of it but it's it's pretty interesting um if you're if you're into that if you're looking for stuff to do if you're homebound but i had another idea we could uh introduced tigers you know to take care of our uh feral hog problem is that slide change yeah but so wild hogs are a big non-native invasive species problem they were first introduced when europeans first came to the americas by hernando de soto and the conquistadors uh you know it provided a source of meat and so if we're going to introduce hippopotamus to 
get rid of the water hyacinth, let's go ahead and <laughs> introduce uh, some big cats that we don't have that can help get rid of them. Um, that, that was a little funny joke. But, um, real quick, I think this is the time where I should talk about an, uh, animals, like especially wild hogs. Uh, I, I guess recently from the uh, Netflix video, uh, Tiger King, if you've watched that, you could see how maybe we might have a wildcat accidental introduction. <laughs> But uh, that's an interesting Netflix show, but it's about people who keep wild cats. Um, but there, you know, if you're interested in learning more about other species of introductions that I won't necessarily talk as much today as I will about plants, but um, there is a uh, Arkansas University of Arkansas Cooperative Extension Service website that talks about non-native invasive species in the state of Arkansas and that website is on that informational resource and I don't know how how much uh, updating they do on that website and I think actually now that I'm thinking about it that website now is hosted by someone else it should still be on the internet, but it may now be hosted under another um, domain, but hopefully that link still works. And if it doesn't, you can, I know you can find it under the, what is now the Arkansas Department of Agriculture. So the Arkansas Department of Agriculture is similar to the Arkansas Department of Parks, Heritage and Tourism. It's one of the big, uh, of the 15 departments now in the state. So the Arkansas Department of Agriculture is the umbrella department for the, what was the Arkansas Forestry Commission. Now, I think they're just called the Department of Agriculture Forestry Division. And there's also the Arkansas State Plant Board. And that's a, that's a really a, um, important and useful um, commission for the state of Arkansas. They do a lot of stuff for agriculture, both um, big row crop agriculture that you see out in the Delta, but also for uh, smaller versions of agriculture. They, they are in charge of our uh, beekeepers. They have apiary stuff. Um, they have a guy that that's his job is to go to the different beehives and and look for diseases and kind of be an extension agent for bees. Um, there's also the Livestock Commission is part of that under the plant department or the Arkansas uh, plant board. Uh, that's that's a little bit deceit deceptive, but they're all under the same uh, that same uh, title, Arkansas State Plant Board. They also in char are in charge of uh, the um, use of pesticides in the state. They are the, they provide license for licenses or they are the licensing uh, folks that would provide you a license to commercially use herbicides and pesticides. So anyone that's applying a herbicide or a pest or a insecticide and getting paid for it, they would need, if they have all their boxes checked, they would have a license for commercial application from the Arkansas State Plant Board. Uh, they register all herbicides for the state. Um, they, do, they do a lot of stuff. And one thing they also do is they are, they are partners with the federal government in keeping their eyes peeled for non-native invasive species that are coming into the state or um, and may have a negative impact on uh, industry. So they do, um, they do, uh, what would you call it? They're not investigations, but they do um, searches through things that are coming in the state of Arkansas on, on a mass scale, like produce that comes from out of state, uh, things that come from China, 
Uh, they're looking through the patch packaging material. That's packaging material is one way that insects are able to be introduced in the state of Arkansas. Um, uh, they, they also, that's also another way that seeds can be introduced into the state. And um, when, so when you have this globalized trade, which is, you know, we're really becoming more and more familiar with that uh, today, because it seems like our, um, what do you call them, our uh, lines of, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the very basic term, but our supply chains um, are, are connected on a global scale. And so to, to show that one, to show to one country that we do not have a certain species, a certain bug or a certain pest that that country does not want to have, we can certify our material or our produce or our commodity. We can certify that to say that we do not have this certain bug, this certain pest, and so they can purchase it from us and, and be reassured that we do not have that pest. And that works both ways. So it increases our ability to, 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 to trade. And so that's kind of their interest in that. Um, to certify that, hey, we don't have this certain pest that is, is a big problem. It's kind of like being a, a self-quarantined um, type of system, if that makes sense. You can learn a whole lot more about that from the Arkansas State or the Arkansas Agriculture Department website. And uh, if you're really interested in it, I would just Google Arkan Arkansas State Plant Board or look at that information sheet I provided. So I'll, I'll talk, uh, get into plants right now real quick. Um, and we'll talk about some of the major characteristics of non-native invasive plants. Uh, one important uh, characteristic of non-native invasive plants is that they have abundant seed, they, they're abundant seed producing producers or they propagate uh, and the seeds propagate with high germination rates. So these are plants that are being introduced from a different continent or a different environment and they are prolific seed producers. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of that. Uh, Chinese privet is a very common non-native species that we have that's really been naturalized to the state. Um, if you're familiar with privet, I, if you're not, I think I'll show a picture of it here shortly, but it's a, it's, a, it's a shrub that has arrived in North America from Asia, and it probably arrived very early on. Um, I think that it was used, it's often called privet hedge, so people they plant it around their homes and it produces a dense uh, divider. It produces a dense hedge that really helps for privacy. It, it um, would make a, a visual, visual obstruction. So that's one reason people like to use it. But it also, and it, and it grows really easily. It also is a, an abundant seed producer. Uh, right now, I have some in my backyard and it's uh, gone, it's going to flower right now, and it will produce just these masses of purple bluish berries. And they, um, probably one plant can produce thousands of seeds and they drop into the water or they're carried off by birds. And those, each one of those seeds produces a new plant. Um, one distinction I'll make here is that, um, and if you're for somewhat familiar with invasive species and these plants, um, hopefully this will just uh, reaffirm that knowledge. And if you're, if you're new to non-native and invasive species, there's a lot of information here. So feel free to ask questions later. Um, but privet is naturalized in the state of Arkansas. So it's a non-native invasive species, but it really is everywhere. It's already gone through its system of invasion. Uh, there are several places in the state that are infested with Chinese and Japanese privet. There, there are several natural areas that have big problems with Chinese privet and it really, you know, from those seeds dispersal, it's really just uh, gotten a stronghold on some areas. 
a species that in contrast to a naturalized plant like privet would be kogon grass. Kogon grass is a grass that arrived here via packaging material from shipments, shipment containers coming from overseas. And also there is a, a hybrid of kogon grass that it was initially used as an ornamental plant. So you could buy it from a big box store like Lowe's or Home Depot, and you could plant it in your yard. It's called Japanese bloodgrass. And Japanese bloodgrass initially was a hybrid of Kogon grass that they thought was a sterile hybrid so that it could not reproduce. Um, but actually it does. Uh, back to my main point is that kogon grass is relatively a new introduction so the state plant board does an inventory for kogon grass well where they'll go to each county and say either yes or no kogon grass is not located in this county and right now arkansas is is supposedly kogon grass free but if you if you google kogon grass and you look at the national distribution map for that non-native invasive species, you can see that the box for um, yes, Kogon grass is here has been checked for a county in Mississippi immediately across the Mississippi River from Arkansas. So it's really knocking on our door if it hasn't already arrived. And so Kogon grass, uh, I don't have much experience with it, but from what uh, my counterparts in Mississippi and Alabama have told me is that it's a very aggressive grass that is shade tolerant. So it can really, it can grow in predominantly sunlit areas, areas that have a lot of sunlight, but it can also grow under trees and other, other vegetation and take over an area really quickly. And one reason it's able to do that is Kogon grass has this really feathery seed head that comes up uh, towards the, later in the growing season and it, it when the wind blows it just disperses that seed everywhere um, in fact I was at a meeting uh, to talk about non-native invasive species in the state and our uh, someone from our research section brought a specimen from our herbarium we have there's a herbarium in our office at uh, 1100 North Street. So it's kind of like a museum or library of plants. And what they try to collect all the plants in the state and map those so that someone can come in and get an idea of what a plant looks like. So I would welcome you to come to our office one day and I can show you an example of Kogon grass. And so you can kind of train your eye to keep an eye out for that. But, uh, our research section botanist was showing us what Kogon grass looked like and as he opened up the uh, folder for it, a little feathery piece of seed started floating in the air. And it was like, oh, well, that's, that's how it gets here is that our research section is spreading the seed around. But it was an example of how easily that seed disperses. Um, and if the plant's producing thousands of seeds, each seed increases the likelihood that it's able to, to spread. Another example would be it spreads through rhizomes or runners. Um, so in addition to producing seed, uh, Chinese privet can, it can be introduced just by roots alone so that um, all it would take is one piece of a root that is big enough to be producing uh, additional vegetative material and it can grow a whole new plant. It, it would be a clone, but it can clone itself and grow a whole new plant and, and create seed, a seed source just based on that one piece of root. And that's a big problem, especially when you're looking to manage against uh, species like privet is that uh, if you're going to dig up the privet plant, you have to make sure that you're digging up every piece of material that's privet. You can't, if you just cut what's on top, it's going to leave that root stock below and it will produce a whole new plant just from that root stock. Um, another thing that privet is really good at is that um, it produces runners so that 
one privet hedge can send out a root laterally parallel to the ground level and that root can start a whole new plant. Um, so that's a very common characteristic of non-native plants that we have in the state of Arkansas. Uh, they have effective dispersal. Again, that's very similar to what we talked about with privet where uh, birds come in, they eat up the privet seeds, they go land on a tree and they digest the seed and drop it and that uh, begins a whole new privet infestation. Um, the Kogon grass is dispersed very well by wind. Um, also by wildlife, that, that feathery material on the seed will easily get a hold of an of, of animal, whether it be a bird or a deer, and disperse that way. Um, it's, it, one example of that, I recently was looking at a Carolina wren that we have nesting right outside our door here. And uh, I took a picture of it and then later on uh, kind of zoomed in on the picture and you could see that the bird had this uh, little piece of grass stuck in its feathers. And it was like, wow, that, that, that potentially could be a seed of that grass. And so I don't, I don't know what grass it was, but if, if it was a, you know, that it would be hypothetically one way that that grass is dispersing itself. And I, I would have never thought that a bird that small would be able to uh, spread something like that. But I guess maybe it was just a really dirty bird. <laughs> but uh, another example or another characteristic of invasive plants or, uh, and invasive species in general is that they lack their natural predators or diseases that were not introduced along with those species. Um, so one example of that would be wild hogs. I'm sure in their natural setting, wild hogs, they're um, especially ones that were not domesticated like the Rush, maybe the Russian boar. Uh, I'm not, that's, that's kind of getting outside of my, my experience, but I'm sure at one point, wild hogs were, populations were controlled by uh, predators like big cats and, and things like that. Well, we don't, if we had big cats in North America, like mountain lions, they, they're, or bears, their populations have been decimated. And so their wild hogs really are able to run rampant and cause millions of dollars of damage to our agriculture and, and landscaping industries. Uh, this is kind of a neat little anecdotal thing that uh, we came up with. And it kind of gives you an idea of what you might be looking at on any given day if you're looking out into, into nature. But it's a pie chart that shows that out of all the plant species that we have in Arkansas, 75% uh, of those plants, or excuse me, 77.5% of those plants are native plants. And roughly speaking, about 22.5% of those plants are non-native and have been introduced from other other um, environments. So, you know that if you're if you're at your home and you don't live out in the woods somewhere or someplace that's been disturbed, a lot of residential areas, I would say that the number is probably a little bit higher, and it may be as much as, you know. 99, 95% of the plants that you see from your front door are likely not native to the United States. And that's uh, one reason is because a lot of the plants that we use are in uh, ornamental industry. They use a lot of uh, plants that are not originally from North America. And it's because they, uh, they are able to grow so well here in the United States. Um, so from here, I'd like to talk about or make an analogy for um, how we go about protecting our uh, native or our native nat native biodiversity, the state of Arkansas's native biodiversity um, from weeds or from non-native species. And I like to say that our natural areas kind of are, are like our garden. Um, it's our garden of native biodiversity. So it's a, a lot of times these systems of native biodiversity 
are a system that is, is regulated by different disturbances. They're regulated by the seasons. So they have a, a, um, a cycle that they go through. Plants grow, they uh, feed insects, the insects ha help to pollinate the plants, the insects also help to feed the birds, and it's a, you know, it's a, it's a cascade of a cascading ecosystem that feeds itself. And then the dormant season comes, everything freezes, and it starts again. Well, when we get these non-native plants, they can really alter that system and it throws the whole system off so that even if you're introducing a non-native plant, it may have unexpected consequences for your bird species or it may have un unexpected consequences for um, your insect species. And, and that one um, negative influence has, a, has an influence on the whole system. Um, so for us, it's very important that we address that, el that negative element on our natural areas. So we want to make sure that what we, what we consider our, our um, produce or our, our ultimate goal on our natural areas, uh, which is our native biodiversity, we want to protect that from um, the negative influence of non-native species. And so that's, that's, a lot of a lot of what my job is and also our other land stewards is to help maintain that system that uh, natural ecological system of our native biodiversity and help reduce and in some many cases eliminate the negative impacts of the non-native species that have been introduced into into Arkansas um, you know I the non-native species really it has a it has a big negative impact on our uh, on our economy. Uh, one good example is wild hogs. They can really go through agriculture and uh, reduce the amount of product that farmers are able to produce in dramatic ways. Um, and I'm trying to think of how I was gonna <laughs> tie that into what I was uh, talking about. I know now, uh, so our na a lot of people think, and it costs, so it costs a lot of money to reduce the amount of non-native vegetation or non-native species that we have in the state. I know that they've spent several years and in, in attacked the problem several ways, especially related to wild hogs, and we still have them in the state. And I know that there's a wild hog commission, a wild hog council, I think, based uh, that um, is represented by different industry leaders and they have meetings and they talk about different ways that they can get rid of wild hogs. And I think there are some federally funded grants now that you can apply for uh, that has brought in like upwards of $3 million into the state of Arkansas to reduce wild hogs. And so that can be a lot of money. We also spend a lot of money in some cases um, with particular projects, reducing infestations of non-native plants on our natural areas. And so I've run, run into it on occasion where people will say, well, why are you doing that? Why is it important to reduce non-native species, especially the ones that are already here? You know, they're, they're here, they've been naturalized. They are, if they're not on your property, or even if you're able to get them off, off the state-owned property, they're gonna be on your neighbor's property. And you can't, if your neighbor wants that plant there, you can't take away that seed source. And what I would say to that um, is that, you know, we own these properties for their native biodiversity that, ha and that native biodiversity really on a statewide level has been reduced. Um, whether it be because of uh, habitat destruction caused by um, building homes or agriculture, uh, that's just, you know, we have to have an economy. And in a lot of ways, our economy is based on stuff that's produced from the land. And, um, but a lot, so a lot of people have natural areas or places that they hunt and fish and whatnot. 
but they're not necessarily managing those properties against non-native species. So while our neighbors may have non-native species, um, they may not be inclined to manage against the non-native species like our agency is, because that's really what we've been tasked with doing is protecting our non-native species or our, our native biodiversity. And so I think it's, for me, the way I justify to folks who, who um, say, why are you doing that work? Or even to myself, when I get real tired of boring, uh, of, of thinking that I'm probably boring the naturalists in training, or if I get really tired myself in the field trying to work to reduce the amount of non-native invasive species, you know, I tell myself, well, hey, not everybody owns, there's not a lot of this native biodiversity left in the state. And a lot of people that, some people that own this type of property, they may not care that much about managing against the non-native invasive species, or they may not have the resources to do that work. And so it's really important for that reason, it's really important for us to manage against those species on the little bit of property left with those native species. I uh, hope that makes sense. Um, where are we at here? What time is it? 10.15, so we've been going for about uh, an hour and 15 minutes. Um, usually about this time, I guess if we were in a room, I would say that we could take a break because we're starting to get into a new um, part of the presentation. Um, what could do you we, guys say? You want to take a break or keep going? Could we, could we take, could, could we see if anybody's got any questions that have come to mind in the meantime and then and then maybe take a, a coffee break just you know 10 minutes yeah. or so okay yep anybody, that'd be great if you have any questions and un, un, yeah just unmute yourself and and ask or if you don't have audio then type them into chat yep i think the chat thing seemed to work pretty well last time if you type them into the chat room area I think I can also maybe type in some things into the chat. Um, like the uh, iNaturalist. Um, link. Hopefully people aren't getting too bored. But here, there's the iNaturalist link. And uh, maybe, maybe what I can do is while folks are getting recaffeinated, I can kind of go through the iNaturalist website. And if you have a question and you want to ask it, feel free to unmute yourself and, um, I don't mind being uh, interrupted, but let me uh, share my screen for the iNaturalist. And if you're if you want to take a break, maybe we can get back at uh, 10, 1025, 1030. Don't you need uh, a break? If that sounds good. Like yeah. uh, I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> Or if you want me to take a break, I can. If you want to. I was no, going to go through the iNaturalist thing. No, I'm doing, I'm, I'm good right now. It does help, I guess, to, to have that natural break from what we've been talking about, what are non-native invasive species, and then move kind of more into the management stuff of it. Um, so if, if that works for you. I know you can't see me, but I really dolled myself up for this meeting. I took a shower and I put on my best suit <laughs> and tie, and I just am so disappointed that you can't see that. Yeah, no, and you're going to sell uh, hippopotamus. Yeah, the hippo. I have a, actually, I have a plate of hippo bacon that I was going to let people see. Yeah. <laughs> we are the, we are losing out. 
Yeah. It's, um, it is kind of weird having done it once where you can see yourself and now I can't. I, <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't have thought seeing yourself would help, but it kind of does because you can kind of make sure that you're still, your arms are still moving. <laughs> <laughs> I have a but I have I a question I'm going to type into chat for when we come back because it may fall into the what's what's happening okay. to manage this kind of thing. I'll just type it out. Yep. So this is my account on iNaturalist. I just logged in on the on the website. And you you do so there like I said, there's the there's the phone app but there's also the website and you do get a few more features. You're able to see more on the website than you are on your iPhone or smartphone, or at least that was the case for me. It may be that I'm just not as tech savvy. And so I couldn't see it on the phone, even though it was there, but the website does seem to provide you uh, or allow you to see more on, on the software than your phone does. But let me see. My username for this is the Arkansasier. A lot of people just put their real names. I wanted to go incognito, which isn't working now that I've told you my username. But <laughs> um, but this is kind of once you set up your profile or once you give it very once you create a username and a password, um, you can log in. And there's a way right here. It says tell your tell us about yourself. Uh, I haven't, I haven't entered that information in, but a lot of people do. They talk about, you know, their background, what they're interested in, and then you can put a profile picture up. Um, you can look at other people um, that are part of the software, have accounts, and then you can actually follow people. So I, I follow a small amount of people or a limited amount. And like I said, I, haven't been using it a whole lot. Um, I've really learned a lot more about it within the past couple weeks or months since we've been homebound, but it really is a pretty cool app. And I would encourage anybody to at least once to introduce yourself to it, to walk through it. Um, it really has helped me with the identification part of uh, being a naturalist. Um, I, was educated in the humanities. So I'm kind of coming at the uh, technical botany skills. Yeah, I'm moving my arms up and down for humanities, but I'm kind of, you know, I didn't have the hardcore bio classes in college. So identification often can be a problem for me, especially when it comes to the native identification. Uh, my work on non-native species, I can, I, I know a lot of the non-native species, which a lot, you know, in my line of work, those are the bad species. So they're kind of like the most wanted plants in Arkansas, the ones that you don't want, or the ones that, you know, if I saw Kogon grass, um, I could call the, the plant board and they would go out and, and figure out a way to remove that plant because that's something that we don't want in our natural system. So I've become really good at identifying and also when you're managing against the plants, these, these methods of removal that we'll talk about here shortly, when you're getting into that type of work, you, you really develop a keen eye to identify privet. I'm really good at saying, oh, that's Chinese or Japanese privet, but not so much the native stuff. But what you can do, what this app actually helps you do is they have something called um, computer vision. And what that does is you can take a picture of a plant or any other biological entity and you can upload it onto the website, which is really pretty easy. And um, so this here is a water hyacinth plant that I found at Bird Lake Natural Area. I was just walking through the woods and uh, doing some other work and, and noticed like, whoa, here's this interesting plant. I think that may be water hyacinth. Where are the hippopotamus? <laughs> and I didn't see any hippopotamus. But I knew that that was a bad plant. And so I took a picture of it 
And uh, I was pretty sure that that was water hyacinth, but if you noticed it didn't have any of the flowers, um, but that kind of is a, a distinct looking plant. Um, it looks really pretty and ornamental. Um, but I uploaded it onto the, the um, platform and that gave me a, um, let's see here, actually what I can do is do, a, I did this the other day, let's see how it works, but I can do a mock, um, a mock observation so I can pick a photograph that I've taken of a non-native invasive plant and I'll make it a relatively easy one so that I know and then um, So here I've just, I'm taking that picture and I'm dropping it in and it is now in the software and it, it has a, it's loading it right now, but it is a picture of, this picture is from Cave Springs Cave Natural Area, which is in Northwest Arkansas, just north of Fayetteville and Cave Springs is a town there. It's right south of Bentonville and that area has this uh, uh, endemic plant called Ozark wake robin. Uh, it's also known as Trillium, and I don't know the scientific name of it, but I'm vaguely from, this is a native plant, Trillium is. There's another plant, if you can see it in the background, that is um, winter creeper. Uh, that is a non-native plant. And we are working to reduce that non-native plant. I don't know if you can see it that well um, on your screen because it's a smaller thumbnail picture. But the, the greener material in the background that really looks like a mat on the forest floor, that's all the winter creeper. And winter creeper, we've ha we have it in central Arkansas. It's a non-native plant that is used as an ornamental plant. Uh, it, Actually, there was a Starbucks going in on Chenal Road in Little Rock, and they, it was a new building, and they were building it, and I noticed that they were landscaping it, and um, they landscaped it with the trillium, with the uh, euonymus, excuse me. They actually planted this plant um, around the um, around the Starbucks, they planted the Euonymus around the Starbucks. So they planted, and it probably wasn't Starbucks that was doing the the landscaping. It was probably a contractor, or you know, they probably rent that property. But they can you see that now a little bit better? Can you see my no. shared screen? No. no. Oh, now we can. Yeah, now it's okay. on a delay. Okay, so in this in this picture, can you see my cursor, my arrow? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so in the middle of this picture, that's the Ozark Wake Robin or the Trillium. That's a not that's a native endemic plant that is only known to grow at Cave Springs and a few other sites. So that's something that we really want to protect. And all this other stuff, aside from that tree and these other trees, is uh, winter creeper. Or you, I, know the I know the scientific name for winter creeper. It's Euonymus fortunii. And it is a non-native in invasive plant that was introduced for ornamental reasons. And even today, there's still, you can still go and buy this plant. I haven't noticed it. So the Starbucks where they planted the Euonymus at, um, I noticed that it died. It actually didn't grow very well. And I think it probably has something to do with how hot it gets here um, in Little Rock and central Arkansas, because in Northwest Arkansas, 
it really can take over an area. Cove Creek, or excuse me, Cave Springs Cave has about uh, 10 acres of this, uh, this Euonymus, this winter creeper that just blankets the forest floor. And you can see how it really is competing against that trillium, that uh, Ozark wake robin. And so um, this is a great example of non-native species work versus our native biodiversity. Um, so there's that picture. I'll, I'll go back to the, um, to the uh, iNaturalist where I just loaded that picture here. So there's that picture. And in, in this slot originally said name and I just clicked my cursor there and it immediately identified the, the native plant, the trillium. So I did, if, had I not known that plant, it would have actually that computer vision or it's also, I think you could say that that's artificial intelligence. It would have identified that plant for me, which is pretty amazing to me. Um, I guess if you're someone that, I know our botanists who are kind of like human walking encyclopedias of plants. They can, they know the plant, they know every plant that you see on the ground. You know, anything that you see, you could rip it out and say, hey, what's this? And they could say, well, that's one of, that was the only plant of its kind in existence and you just ripped it out of the ground. But I think they're really worried about job security because now everybody can walk around with their smartphone and take a picture and it'll help to identify that plant. Or, and it works for birds too. So hopefully I'm kind of getting you excited about the iNaturalist app. Uh, usually the pictures have their <clears throat> dates already logged on. Um, so just for, um, just for uh, the quickness of what we're doing, I'll say that this is really a mock. It won't actually let me, it may have something to do with the, the soft or me doing too many things at once. And then you would put in your location. If you do it straight from your smartphone, it actually would do all this for you. And I think if I wasn't trying to do five things at once, it, it would be easier for me to do. But here's a map and I'm zooming in on Cave Springs, I think. Um, If I knew where Lowell was. I don't want to take up, <clears throat> take up too much time with this. Um, so there's the airport, there it is, Cave Springs. So here's the Northwest Arkansas Regional Airport and here is Highway 49, and uh, this is Cave Springs, the town. So this is a lot like Bird Lake in that this is a natural area right smack dab in the middle of a city limit. And, and you can't see the boundary, but this is, this little square is Cave Springs, and right here is the cave. And there, one reason we own this property is that there is an endemic a uh, cave fish that lives in this cave. The cave starts right here. This is the water that flows out of the cave. And this trail here is on top of the cave. And this cave goes back into the mountainside and this translucent blind cave fish lives in that cave. And it's only, that fish is only known to certain places in the state of Arkansas. And I don't know if it lives in any other state, it probably only lives in Oklahoma or Missouri. So it's something that we really want to protect. Uh, along with that trillium, and the, uh, and the Euonymus really is doing a lot of harm to it. So this is where I want to say that what, that's the general area. And I'm going to update my observation, and it still won't let me do the date for some reason. But... And then over here is where I would say submit my observation. 
So I hate to do it, but my 10 month old baby, I can hear waking up from her nap. So I'm going to take a five minute break. <laughs> Sorry to do that. But no, that's good. That's good. That's good. So if we come back at say like, why don't we just go for like 1045? Is that okay? That's great. Sorry about okay. that. I'll be back. No, cool. 45. So I'm poking around on iNaturalist looking at what projects are in Arkansas, and there's quite a few. Looking at one of the projects, which is uh, Projects Invasives, identifying privets, and it seems like something anybody could do because, I mean, once you know privets, you just log their locations. My whole world is full of privet. <laughs> Look, he took my spot. Yeah. Talk about invasive. The invasive species. species. <laughs> yeah. Well, now you can log them to iNaturalist. I'm not quite sure what they do with the uh, results, though. Unused them. Hey, no dirt. Uh oh. I don't think I can. I know they get the results get factored into a citizen science database, you know. Your pants burned? Oh no. What's <laughs> your yeah, nylon? Identification is not my strong suit, but you know, it's not hard to see privet out there. So finally, I feel like I could make a contribution to iNaturalist. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, I will say I'm staring at Privet like right now out my window. We'll log it on iNaturalist. Right. <laughs> oh. there, I'm, like, I'm like, there it is. There it is. Oh, I have to. That's going to need loppers. Yes. <laughs> the, best, the best thing about it is that 
the roots are usually kind of shallow. It's 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 easier to dig up than like trumpet vine that's gotten totally invasive and out of once control. The trunk, once the trunk gets about that big, though. Yeah, I know. Dynamite. I'm looking right. at four trees of it outside my window right now. Right. <laughs> Japanese knotweed is worse. So. What is that? that, that Oh, I was just saying, Eloise, it's nice of you to join us. Good to see well, you. Well, I, uh, I heard about the, the class at the, the board meeting on, what, Wednesday, Tuesday, whatever uh, day that was. Yeah. And I thought, I can do that. Awesome. Well, it's good to see you. Yeah. Ooh. Annie, I like your fur collar. Oh. Yeah, this is um this is uh Moon Tea or Moon. This is Moon. She's very very elderly, but um she likes to stay warm. She looks very petite. She weighs she, in well at her max weight she was about six pounds. So oh, she right. weighs maybe like four something now. She's like I can carry I just carry her around like she just carry like we just go. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, she's tiny. Yeah. Yeah, she is tiny. She sleeps in my armpit at night. <laughs> really, truly, like she'll be right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably fits her head, you know. It's just <laughs> oh yeah. No. Um she she does this thing where um if she is hungry in the morning, she stands on my face. Oh, goody. Yeah. She's and I'm she knows she's doing it. Well, I'm you glad know. my hound dogs don't do that. <laughs> right. I, I, you know, I've never, I've never intentionally harmed this cat, but once or twice in shock, like, I mean, if you wake up and something is on your face, um, it, it, you know, I've instinctively like thrown her across the room before, <laughs> which is not, not good. <laughs> but she, I mean, she's not deterred, you know. And what, I mean, she obviously, you can see her press up against me. Like, she just doesn't even move. She's just like, yep, this is where it's supposed to be. Yep. Loves her mama. Mm hmm. She's a good, this, is a, this cat's a lot like a dog. <laughs> she's very pretty. Yeah. Thank you. She's sweetie. I have a general plants question. We've got about three minutes left, but um, we've been working on trying to get our yard, uh, which was mostly, I guess, planted in probably the 20s or the 30s. Those things are very established and like with, you know, the azaleas are nice, but they are, the azaleas are fine. Um, then we've got all the Nandina that we've been trying to get rid of because it's just like toxic to everything. Um, we've got monkey grass, we've got trumpet vine that has invaded from someplace down the alley and it's just, it just, I mean, it's beautiful and the, the flowers are good for hummingbirds and everything, but it spreads like crazy and takes over everything. Um, it, it can't choke out the privet, but anyway, we've been, I'm just wondering, we we're trying to replace things with native species and, and it's a, it's a long work in progress. I guess I'm just kind of wondering um, what other people are doing or with, with whatever spaces you've got, you know? Also, if you have any tips for getting monkey grass dug up easily enough. It's oh my gosh. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Is that Judy? Uh, if you've got shade, I have Helleborus. I have very shady yard. And we have we spread. have some. Oh. Privet, you just, I think, dynamite or pull it up. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I go around my yard pulling every spring as the babies come up. I just go walk around about once a week, pull a bunch of it up. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, I live in an old neighborhood also, so there's all sorts of things. What's chocolate vine? Let me Google. Patrick says he uses his yard as an, as, as an invasive species learning and demonstration plot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who should make a series, you know, different yards every week? A little. Oh, chocolate vine. Limited zoom series. Chocolate vine is a shrub that is native to Japan, China, and Korea and is invasive in the eastern U.S. So there. Though it does have pretty flowers. But does it have chocolate? No. no. Yeah. No. I'm kind of desperate. All right. You can I'll buy it, it at $17.99 from Dutch Gardens. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I want to. <laughs> Patrick, are you ready to start again? Where am I? Yeah, if you guys are ready, I think. I'm ready. Well, it's 1045, so I say go for it. <laughs> okay. Well, it's uh, it's real pretty outside. <laughs> well, I just went outside and dropped Mary off with her mom and sister, so um, they're hanging out in the hammock. Uh -huh. uh, what it, I would propose that if you're interested in doing the eye naturalist thing, and um, I can uh, go through some of our uh, strategies for – reducing non-native invasive species, beginning with planning, and then moving through some of the techniques, and then encourage folks to, just so you're not having to sit in front of the computer screen to go out and maybe practice with the app. I would also mention that, you know, there are projects, I didn't really get into that with the, the on-screen demonstration, but there are different projects that you can join. There's, new pro there's a new project for the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission where our research section is really hoping to, to get people excited about making observations on different natural areas. And that will ultimately help with our inventory of the natural areas. Um, so, uh, if that's okay, I don't, I can continue, I can continue to talk <laughs> and take up uh, your computer screen, but man, it's, it's nice where I am. And so if, if, if that would work for you guys, I think that would be a great use of your time too, is to, to go out and, and run through the app if you're interested in it. Um, but you let me know. So uh, right now, though, I talk a little bit about the strategic planning and, and methods that we use to, uh, to reduce the amount of non-dative invasive species on state-owned natural areas. And you could use the same techniques for your yard or uh, city park and, and uh, neighbor's yard, although you may want to let them know before you start removing their chocolate vines that they <laughs> purchased from Lowe's. <laughs> but um, one, one big step in non-native invasive species plant management is to identify the plants that you have and to quantify how much of that plant you have. So at Cove Creek Natural Area, which is a natural area relatively in sort, central Arkansas, um, it is just, it's about uh, 20 minutes north of Conway. Um, north, uh, there's a small town north of Conway named Roos, Wooster, Wooster. Um, and uh, it's north of Wooster, not, it's like 10 minutes away from Wooster. On the Word document for the non-native invasive species resource, uh, informational resource document that I sent um, that you hopefully get through email. It has on the back of that list a map of Cove Creek Natural Area. And so there's a, uh, 
a one and a half mile loop trail out there that's really cool today would be a great day to be out there um, especially if you like cooler weather like I do um, but any time of the year really it's got an overlook that overlooks uh, Cove Creek uh, that eventually feeds into the Cadron uh, and, and it's also got has had and still has a big non-native invasive species problem uh, because of that riparian area, the waterways, it pr Chinese privet has really gotten a foothold there. And it's spread there through the water. Uh, those seeds that it produces float on water and will germinate in the riverbank. And also birds have helped disperse the seeds. Um, so we noticed uh, that there was a problem there. Cove Creek, a little bit of the history, it was donated to the state in 1975, but did not have public access until uh, the early 2000s. So we eventually got public access. One of our neighbors gave us an easement. And when uh, sometimes if we don't have public access, it can be relatively difficult for even staff to visit. So we didn't have a lot of visits to Cove Creek. But when we started to visit there, we noticed that it had a pretty big privet problem. And so one of the first things we did was we identified that it had a problem and started to map everywhere that we saw privet. And so that helped us quantify and measure how big the problem was. And uh, we created the map, this map based on that, the red is privet. And so this is also, a a good example to bring up or a good uh, uh, reference for that biological wildfire. You can see how in red everywhere is where privet was mapped and it's kind of spreading up into the into the draw areas kind of like a wildfire. In a lot of these places, some of the places it was just there were just seedlings kind of where birds had nested or, or hung out in cedar trees and dropped the privet seeds and they were starting to grow under the cedar trees. But some of the places also were just dense thickets of privet. And so it really was starting to crowd out any other plant, um, including our, non, or our native biodiversity. And it was really reducing their populations. And so we produced this map and came up with a plan uh, in order to reduce its impact on the natural area with the overall goal of eventually eradicating it from the natural area. Um, and one of the big tools that we were going to use for this, the overall goal was to get Cove Creek back into, uh, or uh, to assist it to get back into its kind of natural cycle, which is, you know, in the springtime, you have er early ephemeral plants that grow, flower, feed insects and the birds, and then you have a, a what predominantly is a deciduous forest there. Uh, they leaf out, continue to support uh, the wildlife. They're a turkey there. Um, they would be nesting. They nest in about uh, end of May and June. Um, so really trying to get it back into that system where and then also a big part of that system is uh, wildfire was a big component in this uh, pre Smokey the Bear habitat before Smokey the Bear came and extinguished all the lightning started fires for obvious reasons. Uh, Cove Creek would have experienced a wildfire every now and then and these would not have been catastrophic wildfires but fires that would have just burned the leaf material on the ground burned up grasses it wouldn't have been destroying all the trees there because it would have burned on a cycle maybe every five years and so it would have kept material big vegetation or or uh, things that would burn very hot it would have kept those things from um, um, accumulating and so it, they would have been very light burns they probably happened late in the summertime, maybe early in the fall. And so uh, we started to introduce uh, prescribed fire back into the area. And that prescribed fire really helps to promote a lot of our native vegetation that is, has either, is either dependent on 
fire as a disturbance or has adapted to fire as a disturbance. And so uh, a lot of these plants, uh, there are a lot of examples. This, this area right here that's adjacent to the, to the cove, to the creek actually, you can't see it on this map, but this is a big bluff line. And that bluff line, the trail or the overlook actually is right on the bluff line. So th this is probably like a 500 foot drop there, don't fall. Um, but a lot of plants that grow along this bluff line are sun loving plants. So there's some uh, native prickly pear, it's a cactus that grows along this bluff. There are some uh, wild aloe plants, native aloe plants that grow along this bluff and some other plant species that need open habitat. So they're, they grow in areas that have a lot of sunlight uh, in, and that fire really helps to promote that habitat. Well, privet, along with other cultural reasons for fire reduction, privet really doesn't burn that well. It, it likes those rip riparian areas. It's an evergreen species, so it's green, mostly green most of the year or year round. And it really, it likes shady areas. It will tolerate shade, shady areas and sunny areas. So it will grow in a monoculture so that there's nothing else under the privet. Privet doesn't burn, so you only get privet litter, privet leaf litter underneath that doesn't, won't burn in the shade. And so it basically extinguishes fire that may have occurred there anyway. So we want to, our plan was to reduce the privet monocultures and then introduce fire there um, along with some other tools that would eventually help us to get this in an area in a, in a stage that it was just a maintenance stage where even though it's going to take several years to actually reduce privet, the privet shrub, and also the privet seed bank, but fire would be a tool that we could come in every two to three to five years and burn under safe conditions and uh, reduce any re-sprouts. So uh, we'll talk about those removal techniques that we used. Um, uh, uh, kind of a, in full disclosure, there is no magic bullet for, for eradication. A lot, you know, I think Dr. Fauci said there is no erratic, or there is no magic bullet for coronavirus uh, reduction until we get a vaccine. And it's very similar for non-native plants. There is not just one thing that we can do to remove plants. Off, more often than not, we have to have several different tools in our toolbox that we can use. Um, so we're giving it kind of a, a one-two punch. Um, it takes several different, of, a, a number of these different techniques so that we're addressing the problem at multiple stages and out on multiple levels. And I think one thing that you would call, one way that you would refer to something like that is as an integrated pest management program. So we're using different management techniques, uh, mapping, um, and mapping it and then understanding its ecology and natural history and then using a variety of tools in order to reduce its population. One of the tools that we have is chemical herbicide. Um, there are different techniques that we can use to apply chemicals. Uh, one of the bigger ones that we use is to spray the leaves or a foliar application. You can also uh, cut or prune the plant and then use a paintbrush or a, a application device to apply chemical to the to that area that was cut. And also, there are some methods that you can use to inject the tree. That injection is a really uh, kind of a misnomer because you're not actually taking a a shot and and shooting the tree, injecting the tree with herbicide. You're actually um, cutting into the tree and just painting or slightly injecting a herbicide into the, the cut stem so that herbicide in many cases acts like a systemic, uh, it has a systemic chemical reaction where the tree or plant will actually take that herbicide into its uh, vascular system 
and that chemical will work from the roots up. Uh, the chemical, chemical tools, that's probably one of the more, um, uh, not adversarial, but one of the more um, debatable techniques, I guess. A lot of people I know, especially people that want to, uh, a lot of environmentalists, chemicals have been, can be very detrimental to the environment. And so we want to use chemicals as responsibly as possible and to limit the use of chemicals as much as possible. A lot of these techniques that we use are designed to reduce the amount of chemical herbicide that we put into the environment. Um, so a lot, you know, there's one way of uh, dispersing chemical herbicide would be to do a broadcast spray. And that would be where you're basically spraying chemical herbicide over an entire area. Well, we use spot spray techniques, which is that uh, backpack spray where he's only, he's not spraying the entire environment here. He would only be applying that chemical to the only, to only the non-native plants or the plants that he wanted to reduce. And so I think I see here a little mimosa tree, which is a non-native plant. Uh, it's also known as silk tree. Um, a lot of people, these are in a lot of people's yards. Uh, they produce a, like a fluffy orange reddish ball. Um, that's the seed um, or the flower, excuse me, for that plant. Uh, that's not a great identification picture, but he would only be applying that herbicide to that plant. And that helps to reduce the amount of herbicide that you would put into the environment. Um, you know, I, I, I know people that don't like to use herbicide. Herbicide, chemical herbicide, it's a poison. It kills the, kills, it kills the plant and, uh, you know, I don't think they quite understand everything that it can do uh, to, to the human body. You know, in some cases, uh, they can be carcinogenics and whatnot. So if you're not into the chemical application, uh, I understand that. If you're if you're more inter if you're interested in learning more about herbicides, the Arkansas State Plant Board provides uh, the licensing for chemical use. And so, even if you don't do it as a job, even if you don't do it as for profit, you can still go and get a license through them. And the uh, cooperative extension unit, the cooperative extension service. Uh, in Little Rock there, they have an office on universe, South University, just north of the UALR campus. It's actually on the UALR campus. They provide training for chemical herbicide use. Uh, they may not be doing that this year. They, it's probably online. Usually they hold training sessions in a, in a, in a boardroom in their office and they, um, you get a lot of people that are there to get licensed for, um, commercial applications, but you can also just go, I think it's $25 to participate and they train you on best, chem, uh, best practices and how to safely go about using chemical herbicides. So I, would, I re would recommend if you're interested in learning more to go that route, you could find a lot of that information through their website, the Cooperative Extension Service and also the Arkansas State Plant Board. And feel free to email me if you have questions on that. Um, but chemical use really is just one part of, uh, another, uh, or of our toolbox. So another tool for invasive species removal is actually the mechanical, the removal of the, the vegetation. So that would involve seed removal, actually going around and collecting seeds. There are certain species of plants that this works best for. There's, uh, one plant, it's a tree known as popcorn tree or Chinese tallow tree. We have that in Little Rock I've seen uh, growing as an ornamental. It produces popcorn like seeds. It actually, they're green at first, but as they become, uh, as they become closer to germinating, they kind of turn into white, uh, white balls. And so they look like popcorn a little bit. You can go and collect those by hand to keep those from becoming seedlings. Uh, you can also go in and remove the root system. That's a big uh, tool for privet. 
Um, you can remove them by hand or using a hole or a cantilever. I know that uh, I think master naturalists use a uh, grub, a grubber, which is like a, a thing, uh, kind of like a hand tool that you use that attaches to the plant and, you, and then you use leverage to pull that out of the ground. Um, another tool is biological tools. So generally speaking, we all know about cattle and goats and grazing. So I know horses uh, can really graze a pasture down to nothing within a matter of weeks. Um, so grazing, if you had an area that was just nothing but a certain plant like kudzu, you could send in your cattle or your horses or your goats or maybe even lease out some goats to come in and, and uh, eat up the vegetation. And then part of a restoration project, if especially that's what, that would be one example of how we can use our other tools um, in conjunction with one another. And a lot of times we can do that and reduce the amount of chemical herbicide that we put into the environment that can have uh, effects uh, that we did not originally intend to have. Um, so grazing, uh, we had a, a, re uh, um, a restoration project where we were coming in and we were planting hardwood oak trees and we didn't want to spray the whole area. It had a, the area had a, fescue grass, which is a winter, a cold season grass that grows in the winter time and you can use it to feed cattle. Um, but in order to get rid of it, you really have to spray the whole area with the herbicide in the winter time. And we wanted to uh, keep from having to do that. So we uh, came to an agreement with the gentleman who had cows. We put the cows in on the fescue in the winter time uh, or in the late uh, growing season, early fall and they ate as much fescue as they, their hearts desired, and it reduced the amount of fescue that was in the ground, and then we came behind that and planted the trees. And, and so the grazing took the place of a chemical application. Um, another biological tool that may be a little less known are insects. Uh, when I worked in North Dakota, there's a range weed there, it's called leafy spurge, and it can really take over areas in the Great Plains um, where it's just nothing but leafy spurge and it reduces, it competes with the native grasses. And leafy spurge has a really deep root system that can go like 15 feet underground. And so it can be really hard to get rid of. And so they discovered that there's actually an insect um, that is native to uh, Southeast Asia where leafy spurge originated and they introduced, you can introduce that bug to a leafy spurge plant or population and it actually is able to bore down underground and eat the plant from the roots up. Um, so that is a common management tool. Uh, it also has net, can have adverse effects or unintended effects. Um, the uh, American hippopotamus would be a good example of a biological control agent that went awry. Uh, you know, their original intention was to introduce a hippopotamus to reduce the water hyacinth, but I think we can all agree that there might have been other problems eventually for the hippopotamus uh, grazing around in the lower Mississippi River Valley. Uh, you know, if they were able to eat all the water hyacinth, eventually they'd want to go somewhere else and it may be your backyard. So that would be a, that probably would need to be investigated a little bit better. There's another example, a kudzu bug. Kudzu is a really famous non-native invasive plant that was actually introduced by the U.S. federal government. It was used as a, uh, they promoted it as a forage crop for, for cattle and also as a erosion control device. And so the government actually, actually gave kudzu away to people and encouraged them to use it. But now we know it as the vine that ate the South. So it got out outside of cultivation, outside of pastures, and it became a big problem. And so now you have areas that look like someone just draped the entire area with a blanket of kudzu and it has um, outcompeted 
it outcompetes trees, it outcompetes grasses. It can, it just becomes a monoculture. There's a there's a location if you're on your way on I-40 to Memphis and you're passing through Forest City on the east side of Crowley's Ridge on I-40, right as you're passing over the St. Francis River, there's an area where they built, built the interstate where they likely planted kudzu um, for erosion control um, as, a, and a, as an erosion control device. And now that whole hillside is just nothing but kudzu. Um, so there's a kudzu bug that they discovered that in its native habitat back in Southeast Asia eats kudzu. And so someone got the idea, hey, well, let's bring the kudzu bug over to North America and it will kill all the kudzu for us. Well, they have, they have testing protocol that they do for these biological control agents because they want to make sure that they don't have unintended consequences. And the kudzu bug was going through this protocol much like they probably do for um, uh, vaccinations or uh, food products. They want to make sure that they don't have, that, that they don't cause unintentional harm to humans or the environment. Well, the kudzu bug was going through this, um, these stages of approval and someone uh, went rogue and, and released it into the environment either intentionally or I think it may have been intentionally or unintentionally, but um, the kudzu bug got out and it was eating the kudzu and they found out that the kudzu bug, it eats kudzu in the growing season, but it also eats soybeans during the growing season. So they found out that the kudzu would eat the kudzu during the growing season. And it also would eat the soybeans after it was planted. And then in the winter time would hide out in the kudzu that went dormant that had not been eaten. And then in the growing season, it would go back to eating the soybeans. And so it had, it was eating away the profits of farmers. Um, and I think they still have an issue with that in Crowley's Ridge. That's something that the state plant board would have more information on. So uh, that's an example of another control agent that we have. And fire also is another example. Um, you can either do a controlled burn, broadcast burn, like we were doing at Cove Creek Natural Area, where you create fire lines and have a prescribed burn plan and burn uh, several acres at a time. Or you also, they have devices, um, I usually bring one to uh, at, to demonstrate. There's a there's what they call a, a hand torch. I think it is commercially known as a red dragon, and it is a torch, uh, a pipe device that attaches to a propane tank, like you would use for your grill, and it allows you to uh, apply fire directly to any place that you want to apply fire to. I know that they use them when they're doing asphalt work on highways, um, it helps them, I guess they can heat the asphalt using that directly. And then, uh, and then it makes the asphalt, asphalt more malleable. Um, so if you're, if you're, that's kind of a cool toy, uh, toy. Uh, it's a tool, it's a cool tool. Uh, if you're interested in it, I would Google a hand torch or a red dragon. Uh, I know they sell them. You can buy them at Ho uh, Lowe's and Home Depot. Um, so that uh, one benefit, to, one cool thing about that tool is that you can actually use it when it's raining. It, it applies so much heat to one direct spot that you can burn vegetative material even when it's raining. Um, and that's also a good way to make sure you don't cause a wildfire. Uh, so those are some of the techniques that we have. I just have some pictures of, this is some spot spraying going on. This is periwinkle out at a Iron Mountain natural area. It's in Mena in Polk County. And this is predominantly periwinkle and maybe some ground ivy. Uh, and you can see how it's just covered up the forest floor. This is, it looks like early fall, maybe uh, early or mid-fall, early winter time. It's an evergreen species, so winter time is a great time to go in and uh, directly spot spray with the backpack sprayer. Uh, predominantly in our uh, 
eco regions, a lot of our native plants are deciduous. Aside from, I see a pine tree here that's still green, and there probably is some cedar trees in the back, I think. Um, and I'm not sure what this green plant is. But for the most part, uh, if you see something that's green in the wintertime in Arkansas, it's either a pine tree, a cedar tree, uh, maybe there's a river cane, a native bamboo that's uh, evergreen. Um, and American hollies are uh, evergreen. But a lot of times, if you see something that's green in the wintertime, there's a good chance that it's a non native species. And that would be a good way of it's a good way to identify them. It's a good time to identify them. And also, it's a good time to treat them with chemical herbicide because you know that you're not going to be having unintended consequences for native species. Um, here we're uh, treating Japanese honeysuckle during the dormant season with a ATV mounted spray tank. So that's probably a Roundup. Uh, that's a pretty well-known chemical herbicide that its uh, chemical name is glyphosate. And uh, just spray, it's a foliar, we're foliar apply applying it to the foliage of the Japanese honeysuckle. Um, this is a calorie pear tree. Also, they're known as Bradford pears. Uh, it's, this is a very common ornamental plant. They're all over Little Rock. It's a really easy tree to identify early in the spring because it's one of the first trees to go to flower. Uh, if you've ever noticed driving up and down the interstates, in the early spring, you see trees that have white flowers on them, and that's either a cherry tree, which is a native tree, or it's a Bradford pear. And one way to distinguish those two is that a cherry tree has a uh, fragrant, uh, fruity smell, and Bradford pears uh, smell like a dead carcass, uh, smell like um, carrion. And, uh, they are a, a, a very prolific non-native tree that's all over the state. Um, one, I think one reason that they smell like carrion is that they're, uh, they're pollinated by flies and flies are attracted to that smell as opposed to cherry trees that are uh, pollinated by uh, other species like butter, butterfly species that don't necessarily like the smell of rotting flesh. Um, this is a large um, calorie pear tree that's been cut and has been painted with a herbicide that's also been mixed with a dye that you makes it easier to see. Um, so that's this is a really good technique for making sure that we're killing this large tree that produces a lot of seeds and but we're also really limiting the amount of herbicide that we're introducing into the environment. Um, Roundup I don't think has any soil activity so once you put it on this tree uh, it's highly unlikely that the glyphosate is going to leach out from the roots and have a negative impact on native vegetation. Um, Here's an example of mechanical removal. Uh, I think we're actually doing a fire line here, but there, uh, this is at Downs Prairie, uh, near uh, just east of Lone Oak between Hazen and Carlisle. It's in the Grand Prairie region, which was historically hundreds of thousands of acres of prairie right in the middle of the uh, Arkansas Mississippi River Delta that pretty much has been, uh, like 95% destroyed because of rice production. But the state, there still are some remnant prairies and Downs Prairie is one of those. And there's some uh, non-native Johnson grass that grows there. And so one way that we treat and remove the Johnson grass is we mow it, especially bigger infestations of Johnson grass, and then wait for it to re-sprout and then come back and, and spot spray it with herbicide or burn it in the uh, early fall, late fall, and that helps to invigorate native species and uh, um, 
not de-incentivize, but discourage the Johnson grass. Uh, this is a bigger uh, mechanical tool for removal. This is called a, it's a, that's a skid steer, but mounted on the skid steer is a, a grinder head. And basically that's a nine foot stump remover. It has these diamond tipped uh, teeth that will eat at vegetation and basically it can turn a tree into a toothpicks but we use that for really dense privet infestations this is all privet underneath uh pine trees and i think there's some cedar trees this is at cove creek natural area down in the river bottoms i showed you that map earlier that looked like a wildfire with the red privet that had been mapped and this is an impenetrable vine tangle you know that this would be an area really hard to walk through uh, so really the only way to get to there would be to use this heavy machinery that uh, mechanically mulches up the privet. And then we can treat the re-sprouts with either prescribed fire or uh, small doses of spot spraying with chemical herbicide. It's a really neat tr uh, tool to watch. These things are very expensive. Um, so you really have to have make, making good use of your time with the tool. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty cool. And then here's a example of do, uh, conducting a prescribed fire on, this is railroad prairie natural area. So uh, you can see a lot of this vegetation is native. So it's gone dormant in the winter time. Uh, if we did have um, like privet is an evergreen species. We do have privet shrub out here. It would be green. I don't see any in the picture. Um, here is some privet and some Japanese honeysuckle on that same fire getting burned up. So you can see most of our vegetation has gone dormant here, but the privet and the Japanese honeysuckle are evergreen species. And so now during the winter time is a good time to burn those species up if you can get them to burn, especially on really dry days, and then to come back and, and retreat the, the, the re-sprouts either by mechanically removing them by hand or to use a backpack sprayer, sprayer to spot treat or even to come back with native native seed and uh, re-sow native seed into that area so that uh, you're going to help out compete those re-sprouts with native seed uh, for native grasses or native flowers. Um, so that kind of is bringing me towards the end. Uh, We've had a lot of help from Arkansas Master Naturalists, especially the Central Arkansas Master Naturalists, and that's how we've gotten a lot of our work done. Uh, this is at Cove Creek. We uh, had a project with you guys, and uh, it was amazing how much uh, time and effort you guys were able to help with that. And I uh, just want to give a shout out to uh, Central Arkansas Master Naturalists for being such a great partner. Um, are there any questions? Here's some more. We had several volunteer work days out at Cove Creek. Um, I'm not even sure what time it is now. But if you are interested, I would encourage you to, to look into that iNaturalist thing. I think I heard some people talking about already feeling like they could uh, add, you know, helping with the mapping of uh, non-native and native species and help help with the identification process and uh, it really is a cool app um, but that's bringing it down for me this is a uh, this is that website that I was telling you guys about uh, it's it used to be hosted by the uh, Division of Agriculture Research and Extension Cooperative I think it's now hosted by the Arkansas Department of Agriculture. That should be the same um, domain for it, but they have information on potential invaders, which would be that Kogon grass that we mentioned, um, insects, aquatic invasives. Someone one time asked me for a list of invasives for the state of Arkansas, and literally it's thousands of species. Um, but you can narrow it down. I think there are some documents that, that you can find on this website that will give you like the, fur, the uh, 10, top 10 
uh, worst non-native invasives for the state of Arkansas. Uh, there should be a PowerPoint too on that website that if you were gonna do a brief presentation on non-native species, you could use that. And it would, it would talk about uh, vegetation, plant, non-native invasive species, also, and also insects and aquatic non-native invasive species. Uh, there's a lot of resources on the internet about uh, exotic pests. Um, one thing, I get some questions, people say, why do, why do we have the non-native invasive species? Why, why is it a problem for us? And, I, and uh, you got to realize that it goes both ways. We also give plenty of people our native species that become non-native species for them. I think there's a special on PBS about how um, the uh, American raccoon is a big non-native species problem in Japan and Germany. I think originally in Japan, the Japanese got interested in it because they wanted to keep it as a pet because they're cute and cuddly when they're young. But then when they become adults, they get a little bit more cantankerous like I have become in my older age. And uh, people let them out into the wild and all of a sudden they got this uh, mammal raccoon that can be a pest even here in North America where it has its native diseases and predators. Well, in Japan, it doesn't have those things. And so it's able to, its populations have just become, it's overrun what is basically a big island. And so they have a big problem with that uh, raccoon in Japan. They have big problems with rabbits in Australia. Um, there's another video that demonstrates that really well on the internet. If you Google uh, rabbits and Australia, uh, that islands can be very, uh, have, can be negatively impacted uh, by non-native invasive species. That seems to be a common thing where Hawaii has a big problem with non-native invasive species. A lot of that has to do with the, the way the islands have been isolated from mainlands. And so they've really developed their own ecology and uh, spe unique species. And if you just introduce one predator species or one aggressive species onto that location, they can really wreak havoc on, on the problems there or on the native biodiversity. I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> Patrick, question uh, uh, and a few things from our from our chat lineup of stuff. Uh, Michael wants to know what plant is this huge leaf from with the hand in the center, the one that's on this on your slide right now. That is, I stole that off the internet. Perfect. <laughs> that looks like. Yeah. <laughs> I need to beef up my slides. I've taken a lot more pictures now, but yeah, that's a. Uh, that looks like an elephant ear or something like that. But that, I stole it and then didn't uh, cite who's that, who that belongs to. But for the most part, my pictures are mine, but that's, I got, yeah. That's an impressive, you know, gulping thing from yeah. that. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say if, if you, if you are able to scroll back through the chat, some people have had some, oh, there's one other, one other general question. Does anybody know where you can rent or lease a goat in Little Rock? I mean, a, a serious question, <laughs> you know, like, uh, I know there are people that do it. Uh, um, I have a friend that lives in Conway and he has goats. And if you're interested, I could maybe put you in contact with him. It might uh, Tom, Tom Frothingham. Well, no, I'm, I'm reading the questions. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Saltbush salt bush is a native uh, shrub. It's uh, scientific name is uh, Bacris halimifolia. It's yeah. it's a saltbush is a native species, so it it has been in North America before Columbus discovered America. But because of climate change and habitat destruction, its range has expanded. And in areas that have been heavily disturbed, saltbush can really become a monoculture. And uh, it also is a semi evergreen. Um, so saltbush actually, it's a good. Uh, it can be easily identified in the early, uh, the fall and early winter. It goes to seed 
in at the beginning of the dormant season and it has it's a green bush that has these uh, fluffy white seeds on it so it kind of looks like snow a little bit just slightly um, but it is it's an it, it would be an example example of a native invasive it, it can be really weedy um, yeah. that being said if you do restoration if you um, incorporate restoration techniques like planting native vegetation native trees native grasses saltbush can uh, can really be hit hard by those especially if you just cut them and plant over them um, I do know that it is a non-native invasive it's been a big invasive species problem in Australia and in the Mediterranean where it was introduced for ornamental reasons and uh, because it's not native to those areas it has really been very problematic for for places like that and I think they have actually found a biological control agent it's like a stink bug that is native to North America that reduces its uh, ability to grow and seed. Mm. But yeah, that's a, that's a good plant to see along the highways in Arkansas. Uh, and it grows crazy in highly disturbed areas. Uh, Kogon grass is spelled C-O-G-O-N. Yeah. C-O-G-O-N. Yeah, I'm sure K-O-G-O-N will get you the same results. It looks like someone entered in the profile for that. Um, Biodiversity of Arkansas is a great project on iNaturalist. Privet is in everybody's backyard, <laughs> but uh, it's, a, you know, I have it in my backyard and I can experiment on ways to reduce it. And I know that if you just cut it, it will grow back. Um, who does goat leasing in Arkansas? Uh, that's a good question. Maybe the zoo? <laughs> uh, but I do, we can figure that out for you. Um, there are feral hippos in Colombia. I think I've heard they came from Pablo Escobar. Uh, he, the big drug kingpin, he wanted to have his own zoo and now they have uh, Colombian hippos. Uh, calorie pair is a big problem. And I think that's the, I'm right. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Um, Judy Henderson, do you have a question? You have a, a, an icon on your, your screen that says your hand is up. So. But I don't even. One thing. I, yeah. Sorry. Okay. One thing I like to do usually is um, at the beginning, ask everybody what they're interested in. Uh, personally, because I know each, per, you know, each naturalist is different in what they're interested in. And, you know, some people are more excited about doing trail work. Some people are more excited about doing the outreach and education. That's one of the cool things about master naturalists is that you can, you can be involved as a master naturalist in so many different ways. And so I usually like to ask people, what is their particular interests? You know, it may be they're interested in everything, or it may be that they're just interested in um, doing one one type of volunteer work. But I think one thing about that's neat about invasive species is that no matter what you're doing, you can always have some type of element of non-native invasive species work as part of your work. If you're doing trail work and you're cutting vegetation, you can use that invasive species knowledge to to reduce non-native species vegetation on the trail. So if you had to choose between cutting down a tree that was native or non-native to make the trail corridor larger, you could cut down that non-native tree. Um, also, we've had, we've encouraged master naturalists to do non-native seedling removal at Cove Creek on the trail there as they walk the trail. So you can be taking a leisurely hike um, and just occasionally pulling uh, privet seedlings from the trail and that helps tremendously because even though it's a small little bitty seedling eventually if left alone for for a long enough uh, long period of time that would become another seed producing um, plant and so you're really even though you're doing a small amount of work that work in the future 
grows with interest. Um, so I think anything that you're interested in, uh, you can uh, apply some small part of non-native invasive species to that outlet. Um, whether, like I said, like trail maintenance or outreach and education, there's a lot of stuff to, a lot of people just don't have that much knowledge about non-native invasive species. And when you do get that knowledge, you're kind of, your whole world uh, view can kind of implode because, you know, what the, you know, I hear a lot of people say, oh, well, we had a silk tree or a mimosa tree growing in my grandmother's yard when I was young. And now you've told me that that's a bad tree and uh, I don't want to be your friend anymore because you t you're telling me to cut down my grandma's tree. <laughs> um, but it, it's kind of, I've heard people say that about uh, the Bradford pear as well. Uh, once you start noticing the Bradford pear on the highway, you start to see it everywhere and it can be really depressing. <laughs> but um, That's job security for me. So especially in these times of coronavirus, keep up the job security. Yeah. But... Any other questions? Greedy goats in Fayetteville. <laughs> Greedy goats, okay. Cool. Well, Patrick, thank you. I would, I would recommend that, that we do what you suggested doing, that people go out with iNaturalist and photograph stuff and learn about it. I mean. Yeah. Um, it looks like if you stay in the sun, it, it, it can be warm. It is a little cool in the shade, but um get on iNaturalist and and look for the projects and um it seems like a really cool way to to learn more about not just non-native species but also uh naturalists in general yeah. um and then I those resources the email the email uh informational resources if you want to look through those as well and um that, uh, I think it might have my contact information on it. Feel free to contact me with any questions and uh, hopefully I'll be able to put some faces or faces to names uh, real soon in the future. Um, come by our office uh, when, when you can. Um, I think they make you take your temperature right now. So maybe wait a couple months, but <laughs> our office, Herbarium is really great. It's really pretty crazy how much um, how much work they've done that goes into that. It really is like a a museum of plants for. Um, and then maybe one day we can actually schedule, excuse me, a time to get out and go through some of the tools that we have in our shop, and also maybe an actual uh, field day to get out and to do some exploring and and become more familiar with non-native species. That would be really cool. Y'all have y'all have an amazing facility as well as as well as it being beautiful yeah. and stuff. It's it's worth knowing yeah. about, I think. So Yeah, it's a really cool building. Uh, um, we would be doing the class today if we were in right. person. <laughs> yeah. so, or uh, the other day, whenever we had it originally scheduled it. Yeah. yeah. When uh, Michael Barger had suggested uh, another iNaturalist project that's really good is uh, Never Home Alone, and if you search for projects, it will it will pop up and you can you can find it. Okay. Um, yeah. You can also ask him about it too, or send him an email or something. Um, Patrick, you sent you emailed Nancy some a couple of documents. I will email those to everybody who's attending today in just a okay. minute. Um, okay. I don't guess I've got anything else right now. I'll probably wait till the meeting's ended and then think, oh yeah, I was gonna ask about something. Um, but I'm 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 good to go if y'all are. So thank anybody? you, Patrick. Yeah, thank you so yeah, much. I'm putting in my email real quick. Oh good, thank you. My email address, uh email away and if I don't have the answer, I likely know someone who does. <laughs> right. Um, we need to get your uh, 
a mailing address that's good for you too. So we can, in addition to our, our unending thanks and appreciation, we're gonna send you a gift card because that's what we do. <laughs> we can't pay you. So anyway, uh, yeah, but I'll, I'll I have that, that Ann. Do you? Okay, cool. I have it. Yep. Um, we're good. Then we're good. Or you could come over and we can look at all the non native plants we have in our yard. <laughs> Go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Y'all take care. Good to see, see you next you. week. Same bat time, same bat channel. <laughs> take care. Look forward to meeting you guys in person sometime. Yeah, thanks again, right. Rick. So, Ann, yeah, I have two sets of documents to send you. I think I sent you one. Okay. And uh, I'll send you the other one to forward to folks because he sent some about iNaturalist and some about invasives. So, okay. rather than, I don't know if you can put them all in one, one mailing or not, but I'll send them your way as soon as I get off the meeting. Okay. Nice all right. See. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Yep. Do you want to send out a survey monkey? Yeah, I sent you the I sent okay. you the, the stuff okay. this time. All and right. if it's not there, holler. <laughs> I, I will. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Just clear it. Mm -hmm.